Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today on this webinar. My name is Matt Kelly, and I am your host for the next hour as we talk about data analytics and its applications in auditing and accounting. Uh, we have several great speakers joining us today, and I think they'll both talk about how they're using analytics in their daily work right now, the skills and expertise that you would need to put analytics to its best use, give us some good, interesting examples of how they are using analytics in their own practice and daily work. Um, and we have, I believe, more than 350 people registered for our webinar today. So this should be a great and lively discussion. Uh, first, let me introduce our speakers for the hour. Uh, first, we are going to have Pranav Guy. He is co-founder and CEO of CalcBench. Pranav does plenty of analytics already today in his work uh, at CalcBench. And then prior to CalcBench, he had also worked on analytics and financial research at Morgan Stanley, TIAA, and ITG. Uh, he is also heavily involved these days in data quality and structure issues, working with XBRL US, the CFA Institute, and uh, other bodies. Uh, next, we also have with us Brian Wollahan, who is partner in charge of the audit innovation team at Grant Thornton. Brian serves on the data analytics task force at the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board as well, and he is a board member for the Data Analytics Research Center at Rutgers University. Uh, Brian, are you out there? Hello? I'm here. Hello, hello. Glad to have you. And uh, we'll also have with us Vern Richardson. He is the Distinguished Professor of Accounting at the Walton School of Business at the University of Arkansas. Vern has been working in data analytics for many years and literally wrote the book, on data analytics, which is aptly named Data Analytics for Accounting. Uh, so Vern, hello and welcome to you too. Hey, thank you. Thanks for uh, hosting this session. We're excited. Sure. And so a quick order of our events here for the hour. Uh, Pranav is going to begin with a few welcoming remarks. Uh, he promises to be brief so we can get right to our guest speakers. Then we're gonna shift over to Brian. He is gonna talk for maybe about 15 or 20 minutes on the power and potential of analytics in auditing. And he's going to give us a few whiz bang examples of what he's doing in his work at Grant Thornton. Uh, then we'll switch to Vern for another 15 or 20 minutes on how you can develop the right skills and expertise for analytics. And also Vern says he's going to show us some examples of the whiz bang projects that he is working on in his teaching work at the University of Arkansas. Uh, after that, We'll go and work our way through Q&A as often as possible. Um, you can submit questions anytime in the hour, and please do so. We'd love to have them. Um, actually, in fact, let me just go through a few housekeeping details here before we really formally get started. The webinar is being recorded. Uh, everybody who is listening today, you are muted by default. Uh, as I said, we love questions, so submit them anytime using the Q&A function on your screen. Uh, and then we will get to those either at the end of the hour or if there is a particularly apt question, we might drop it in and try and answer it live. Uh, and for anybody who is curious, unfortunately, we are not offering continuing education credit for this particular webinar, uh, but we still plan to have a, a lot of discussion going on here. So with that, uh, Pranav, if you are out there and you want to give us our welcoming remarks, we're, we're happy to hear what you have to say and get rolling. Thank you, Matt. Uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, last fall, we hosted our first webinar at CalcBench on goodwill and impairments. And uh, that was with our friends uh, PJ Patel at uh, Valuation Research Corporation and Dan Godet, who's a uh, chaired tenured professor at the Stern School at NYU. We we're unsure how the webinar would be received given, you know, Zoom fatigue and the environment. But our clients loved it and asked for more. So here we are today with our second webinar, and we hope that you find it as informative as the first. A bit about CalcBench before we get started. Uh, my co-founder, Alex Rapp, and I founded uh, the company believing that there were other people just like us that had used sort of the standard products in their work lives, things like Faxet and Capital IQ, you, you know who you are, and uh, always found something missing from those platforms. So we set out to sort of fill the gaps. And uh, many of the things that we do and the uh, questions that we ask and the answers to those questions are, are hidden sort of in the dark corners of the financial statements and the disclosures. 
uh, commonly, you know, in the vernacular, we refer to those as footnotes. So we, we built CalcBench, you know, to make it easier to access all of that data in the footnotes, uh, textual, numeric, whatever it is. And so now almost a decade later, uh, we're thrilled that our financial platform has uh, it's helped so many people go deeper into their own financial analysis. So we've got FP&A users of Fortune 500 companies using this, portfolio managers and research analysts at big major asset management firms, and that's both on the hedge fund side and the traditional space. We've got auditors at top accounting firms here using this. We've got regulators. And of course, uh, you know, something that's very near and dear to our hearts, we've got professors in major universities using CalcBench. And you'll hear from Vern uh, about things like this later uh, in, in the hour. Um, all of them, you know, the u universities and professors incorporate their platforms, our platform into their curricula, their teaching. Um, you can go in and do cross-sectional analysis. You can do time series analysis, looking for patterns and variances on as filed information, lots, lots more. Uh, a couple of things I'd like to point out um, just for those users. Um, and for if you're new to CalcBench, if you're just hearing us for the first time, uh, you know, you can go to calcbench.com and check us out. We've got a two week free trial. All of those things are in there. Um, we also have a blog that is very useful. Um, people uh, comment on it all the time. Um, it's over in the lower left-hand side of the, of the website, or you can go to calcbench.com slash blog to see the history of the blog posts. We do things there, uh, you know, all the way from a micro level at the firm, all the way to a macro level, um, looking at data specifically. And so recently, some of the things we've done, you know, on a micro level, we looked uh, yesterday, actually, at the 10K that came out from SolarWinds to see what, what was in there about the, uh, the data breach. Um, we also published yesterday a list of companies and uh, their sales to China. So as a portion of uh, their, their overall revenue. So these are things that over the years have gotten more and more attention from people. And so we thought we'd write about them and highlight those things. In addition, uh, CalcBench has been featured in a couple of recent Wall Street Journal articles that you might find interesting. Uh, one on February 23rd uh, about COVID adjustments to earnings. And yes, we've got that data. Uh, another one on February 4th, which was very interesting, was uh, it was uh, predicated by all of the, the market activity, uh, you know, around uh, the GameStop stuff. And it was about the risks of accelerated share repurchase programs. So those are two uh, very recent articles as well. And um, so with all of that, we're really, really excited to have Brian Wallahan and Vern Richardson share their insights with us today. We're thrilled to have Matt Kelly of Radical Compliance moderating it. And, uh, and, and I'll just turn it over to Matt now. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, yeah, thank you very much as well. Let me call up the slides again. I had a small technical failure here, but. Let's see. Ryan, you will be up first as soon as the slides come up. All right, perfect. So um, I will lead off then with um, just kind of a quick quick introduction to um, not just what we're doing in, in audit today by way of innovation, but more importantly, the why. Um, I think particularly for, uh, for our audience today, um, having that, that framework to understand why we do what we do uh, in audit in particular will be very, very helpful. And um, um, I'll, I'll point to the, the top right corner of this slide just for starters. And thinking back over the last seven years, as we've developed, there we go. Um, as we've developed our, our, our latest suite of innovations since I rejoined the firm, uh, we've really been focused on audit quality sort of as our North Star. That's been uh, our principal purpose and focus of what we've developed. Uh, we set out really thinking, how can we use the new tools and tech and the new data we have available today uh, to do the highest quality audits? And uh, we began looking at full population analytics, uh, coined a phrase, whole ledger analytics, which is now sort of a, a pervasive uh, term uh, in, in the uh, profession. Um, and uh, in doing that, found, found that the, the samples that we were pulling, the items we were testing were more meaningful. We were finding uh, notable transactions instead of uh, you know, testing items that didn't seem to have a whole lot of purpose 
under a random uh, approach. Um, and in the process of doing that and executing these high quality audits, we began to find things that we never would have found before, uh, insights coming out of the data. Um, interesting here, uh, hearing micro and macro insights there. Um, I use the same phrase internally here and just published an article on that. Um, thinking of micro insights as being the insights that come out of transactional level data that we can get on an audit and then macro being uh, some of the big picture analytics, uh, you know, gross margin, KPIs, industry level benchmarking using tools like CalcBench and, and data we get from other vendors. Uh, some of the insights that we find at this level can relate to manual entries that maybe we can automate or a client can automate. Um, uh, opportunities to streamline the close process, accelerate that. Um, uh, finding you know, errors in the financial reporting process, even if they're not material, just working out the kinks there and helping clients think through how they can streamline the financial reporting process. And then efficiency. Um, as we've evolved here in the process, we've found um, that the analytics themselves can lead to efficiencies. Uh, by disaggregating populations, we can, uh, we can focus our efforts and sometimes get an improvement in the sample sizes. Um, and then automations obviously are, are geared almost principally at efficiency, um, where we can kind of take some of the drudgery out and automate some of the manual steps that our auditors are going through. Um, and our clients appreciate that because you know, we're saving them time with the streamlined process and, and, and better sample sizes. And the samples that we're coming to them with, uh, they're, they're, they're asking us how we found them uh, because they're, they're, they're the interesting activity from the prior year. So moving to the left here, just a quick overview of the what, when we talk about innovation, we find it helpful to, to bucket that into automation, analytics, and AI. And I've, I've been on a bit of a mission to uh, demystify some of the buzzwords in the space. And artificial intelligence, in my mind, is really just sophisticated, automated analytics. So it's not self-aware computers at this point, um, but, um, uh, but rather just really a really good analytic. In the middle here, our final point on this slide is uh, the how. So we think of people, process, and tech as driving all of this. And the process and the tech I found to be a lot easier. Um, the, the, the difficult part for the profession has been uh, doing audits in a new way, uh, embracing tools and tech that require a level of effort to, to get to understand, to deploy, to interpret, uh, to understand the, the, risk, the risks that come with uh, various innovations and the opportunities that come with them. And, um, and, and having those be in a position where, where there's a level of comfort with the regulators with those new new tools. So that's kind of a quick overview of, I wanted to hang this whole conversation uh, on these benefits of quality insights and efficiency. We can go to the next slide. Let's see, there we go. This I thought would be helpful too, just to show that, that analytics really aren't uh, just occurring in the audit itself. There are analytics occurring in the profiling on the front end um, before we even do an audit we're running predictive analytics that can identify outsized risk in a portfolio of companies. Uh, and risks are referring to there are, you know, risks of restatement or MWs, tier weakness, uh, bankruptcy, uh, financial reporting fraud, things like that, uh, using publicly available and historical data that everybody has access to. And this, in this bucket here is where we would use something like, you know, CalcBench can give us, uh, you know, industry level data uh, that we can use in that in that area. Um, I know Vern's going to talk about um, uh, Altman Z and, and, and bankruptcy scores. We do use that and Merton distance to default and uh, operational solvency liquidity metrics, uh, a battery of different uh, analytics on the predictive front. They all have strengths and weaknesses. So we like to use them together in what we call an ensemble approach. So see what they say as a group. Um, and I'll highlight two there just for the, uh, this may be of interest. Uh, we're talking here on the profiling side about inductive uh, reasoning. In other words, we're making um, references or inferences about a whole group of companies and cohorts of companies that may have risk characteristics. We're not deducing that any one company it has a problem, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, second program area there is forensic support. So um, um, after we built the risk profiling program, we stood up this program to respond to some of the, the flags or the risks that were being, uh, potential risks that were being surfaced by the uh, risk profiling. Um, so this was uh, sitting down with teams and talking through the models, talking through the risk the models we're seeing, talking about whether or not they made sense or whether they were off. Uh, they are a blunt instrument in many cases. 
and really asking the engagement team, what are they seeing in the field? Um, what do they see in the transactional level data that they have that the models don't have at the profiling level? And then when we land on a handful of risks there, what can we do about that? Um, you know, advanced journal entry testing, uh, creating new analytics to respond to those risks. In many cases, those analytics then we brought to bear and released to the entire audit practice in this third bucket, which is audit data analytics. Uh, this area here is predominantly using client data, GL data, and the analytics there are transactional level analytics in many cases. Uh, I'll talk about whole ledger a bit, but that's kind of our flagship analytic. Um, and that includes a transactional scoring component and account combinations analysis, which is like account pairings, but looking at every unique combination of debits and credits, numerical and digital analytics. Um, I know Vern's got a, a reference to Benford's. Uh, we have something like that that's uh, a, really an extension of the Benford's concept. Uh, and then text and letter analytics, looking at the words that are used in a GL, if you can believe that, um, we can see trending there and changes that, that might merit attention on an audit. So I'll, I'll pause there for any questions so far, and then we'll go to the next slide. Well, Brian, I did have one question, just looking at all of the potential capabilities here, um, that data analytics can provide all sorts of answers, assuming people know the right questions to ask. And I just wonder, when you are working with various teams, trying to see how you can assist them, like what are the challenges in them understanding, we wanna answer this, we wanna answer this, like how, how well are they um, in a good position to be able to ask some good questions to take advantage of analytics? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, and I'll put that under sort of the change management bucket, um, the, uh, the support of analytics bucket. Um, we rolled out um, you know, FAQs and user guides and templates and we have trainings and there's a, you, every time you roll out a new tool, you've got to make sure that uh, uh, it's well articulated what the tool, where it fits best, best what it does, how to interpret the results. Um, so that's a great question. And um, I'll provide an 80-20 view there on some of that, which is that a lot of the, the, the tools we roll out can be very, very effective right out of the gates, using them exactly as we design them. But there are, let's call it 20% of the engagement teams might want to tweak um, mm -hmm. that tool. And we've got flexibility in the tools, allowing them to promote, demote, or eliminate routines that are being used in the analytics uh, so they can customize that for their audits. All right. Um, in that case, uh, I think uh, we have one other question here. I'm not sure if you have to discuss this right now, but somebody's asking, can Brian please share his paper about micro and macro <laughs> insights, or at least refer us to it after the presentation. So somebody there yeah. is looking at your past work. I don't know if you Absolutely. want to Absolutely. So if you, if you go to my LinkedIn page, I actually just put that article up there under publication. That's the first one. All right. Hey, Brian, I was going to ask you, is, is this something the line auditor is going to use? Uh, I mean, to what extent is analytics just going to be centralized? And at what point will it be decentralized? I assume it's centralized now, but is steadily being rolled out to the line auditor? It's a bit of a blend there. And, and, and I can tell you've looked ahead at the slides, Vern. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we do cover that a little bit. Um, I'll say something like whole ledger analytics is used on almost all of our public company audits. So that's pervasive. It's in the hands of our teams. Um, some of the, uh, the automations that we're developing, um, as they're coming online, they're being developed in a national uh, central role, uh, piloted on a handful of audits, rolled out to uh, 50 audits, and then released. So many of the innovations are moving through that, that life cycle uh, from uh, a centralized development or even an engagement team development and to a, to a national rollout. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So this is the last slide on analytics. I just wanted to give a, kind of one image here on transactional scoring. Uh, what we have on the screen here is, is one of the outputs of whole ledger. And this is effectively risk ranking every single journal entry against several dozen proprietary routines that are designed to detect the risk of management override. We have uh, each dot is color coded by user. So the, the colorful dots are manual entries and the gray dots are automated entries. And we plot on the X axis, a composite score based on that customization of the routines that our engagement teams apply. And on the Y axis, we show the impact on the income statement. We can, we can scale this by 
balance sheet impact and other ways, but this is kind of the default view. Uh, in looking at the activity this way, we can focus our attention in the upper right quarter or quadrant or a couple of percent even of a population and draw entries from there to test for management override. And I've got one example here, which is redacted, but it's a real story. Um, an entry on the last day of the year, boosting net income by $217,000. $217, and the description was to balance the subledger. Um, so this turned out to be okay. It was a cleanup entry, but it highlights the kind of, the kind of activity we're looking for with these tools. Um, making sure that that wasn't a you know, judgmental override and that was a legitimate entry. And sometimes insights coming out of an entry like that. Why did we need this level of cleanup? Uh, what can we do to make sure that those entries are right on the front end? Next slide. So moving on from analytics into automation, I uh, wanted to just kind of highlight that, that we are really automating the entire process from acquiring data from a client to work paper generation. Um, so it starts with the acquisition or the at least access to client data. And I make that distinction because some of our clients uh, just provide access to the ERP and we can hop in there and uh, see and analyze and, and, and do whatever we want with the data. Uh, but in most cases, there is a uh, data provided in a cloud or, or transferred uh, into our uh, software uh, for, for analysis. Um, so that data acquisition step is, a, is the, the most critical and uh, oftentimes time consuming part uh, of an analytics engine is getting the right data and then transforming it, which is effectively normalizing the data. Uh, if we're getting data out of several thousand ERPs, uh, depending on the ERP and the instance, they may refer to things like revenue different ways. They won't all say revenue. So we effectively, we have scripts that will normalize all the data from all of our audits into a common language, a common data uh, model that we can then feed that normalized data into uh, our, our analytics engines. And at that point, you know, once we've transformed and validated the data, it's as easy as uh, letting the analytics run. Uh, the outputs come out, our teams interact with it, they sort through it, they pick items to test. Um, we also here on the top in the, uh, what is that, the uh, fifth node re reporting, uh, automated work paper generation. I use the word report there loosely because that can be work papers, it can be spreadsheets, it can be visualization. It concludes sort of the audit step. Uh, then when we get into augmentation, what we're doing is providing a feedback loop where our auditors can look at the outputs there and say, hey, this item was flagged or this item wasn't flagged and it should have been or shouldn't have been. And we can take that feedback back into the analytics engine and approve that for the next year. And then benchmarking is capturing, you know, you've got this, um, you've acquired, transformed and analyzed and, and into standardized reporting uh, work from thousands of audits in an anonymized redacted way that can provide a powerful set of data for understanding risks across a portfolio of similar companies. Brian, can I ask a question? Um, when we're looking at this slide here, the extracting and the transforming and the validating, what are the, I guess, the protocols or the, the safeguards to make sure that we do have the completeness and accuracy of the data is maintained as we're validating and transforming it into something suitable for analytics. But how do we make sure that we're still looking at the original apples for an apples to apples analysis? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's all of the sort of traditional, you know, reconciliations and cross checks and, uh, you know, validating the number of entries is right according to what was in the ERP, mm -hmm. uh, making sure it ties to the trial balance all of that stuff that we've been doing for a hundred years, we're doing the same thing, but we're doing it with scripts. Um, so we've taught the bots to do that for us instead of having to do that manually. Um, and and that's, that's, a real, that's a real coup because that can be, that can be a tough, has been a tough uh, part um, uh, of auditing in years past is just getting, getting the data. Yeah. Anything else on that one? No. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, the topic du jour, uh, what, do our, what do our auditors need to know how to do? How can we prepare this next generation of, of auditors and, and, and 
uh, in analytics and automation and things like that. Um, and Vern, I'll, I'll give a hat tip to, uh, to your framework here. Um, I, I've developed this before you and I talked and, and I'm seeing tremendous similarity in, in this list in your framework, which is much simpler and easier to remember. Um, but um, when I think about what our auditors need to be able to do today, it's, it's asking the right questions, as, as Matt said, and then thinking about what data might exist to help answer those questions. What analytic techniques can be brought to bear to answer questions? And I put a note in here to just listen to what the data has to say. I wanted to highlight that we don't have to go to the data with a question the way we used to have to do. We can slice and dice the data so many different ways and see what surfaces. We might see, see insights coming out of that, that approach that we would have never thought to ask. So it is a combination now of asking questions of the data, but also just listening to the data. Sharing the results, telling stories about what the data means, helping folks that maybe aren't as familiar with analytic techniques to understand what the analysis is saying. Uh, coding, you know, writing, or at least being able to edit scripts in, in multiple languages or one language, um, and learning new languages. I will highlight we are language agnostic, uh, coding agnostic. In fact, there's a lot of uh, tools out now, we, we think of them as coding for non-coders. Uh, coding has been made so easy by uh, some of the new, new software packages out there now, like, like Alteryx. Um, communicating questions uh, when you have an analytic looking at the results and asking the people uh, that, that may have insights into that output, uh, kind of what might be going on in there, and then maybe often iterating and, and going back to the data with new questions. Uh, collaborating with people of different perspectives. This is more important than ever because the world has gotten more complicated, the data has gotten more complicated, and uh, uh, having multiple skill sets uh, coming to bear, uh, accounting and auditing skills and finance skills, data skills, automation skills, analytic skills, uh, together to create innovations is really a very powerful combination that's harder to find in one person uh, today than it was uh, in the past. Um, managing projects with multiple dependencies. I mean, audit is really a, a project management exercise and developing new innovations is too. Knowledge of US GAAP and audit standards, uh, certainly important. And I know Vern's gonna touch on this, but I feel like there's room in the profession now for, for uh, more folks that aren't CPAs. Um, and that's where I've got these skills at the bottom that I think are incredibly helpful today. Uh, all under the banner of data manipulation skills exhibited via proficiency with these kinds of uh, tools. And I don't want the, I don't want to limit the list to this, uh, what's on the page, uh, but effectively the first row is dealing with large data sets, understanding how to, to load and populate and normalize data. A second row is on automation, uh, Alteryx, automation anywhere, et cetera. Um, third row here is on analytics. So ACL, Python, Power Query, et cetera. We were talking about R this morning, actually, in the context of regression, uh, Vern, which I think you'll appreciate. And then lastly, the, the, the visualization engines, Tableau, Power BI, Click. There's multiple packages out there. Uh, we use Power BI a lot because we can publish to our whole firm in one click, um, where we can't do that in Tableau as easily. But, um, but really, any visualization engine that helps you tell stories is a plus. So I'll pause there for questions on that. So Brian, probably following up on my earlier question and maybe help me in a little bit later, is this required of 10% of auditors, 100%, 50%, and, and when do we get to steady state? I mean, does everyone need to know this? Is this a special office centralized or? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and uh, my final slide will allude to that a little bit, um, but I, I think it's a continuum. Um, so, so we can certainly work with folks that are, that are, you know, just know they're CPAs and no auditing and accounting, right? But I think that auditing and accounting is evolving into an analytics world. So picking up some proficiency across those data wrangling skills is going to be a huge plus to any auditor. Um, and conversely, we can hire folks that aren't CPAs, but are really, really good at, uh, at wrangling the data and building tools. Um, so what I'm showing on this screen here, you, you, Vern, you asked about a national office. If you look at the gray column in the middle, um, you can have a, in my case, we've got a centralized innovation team um, that uh, develops tools and rolls them out to the practice. 
if you move down one row, you may have engagement teams, which are, are spinning up innovations, uh, most commonly for a lot of firms, automations um, uh, using Alteryx, which is, like I said, very intuitive and easy to use. So engagement teams that aren't in the national office might be creating innovations. And in many cases, we can, we can take those and scale them and roll them out to the whole practice. And then at the bottom here in the, in the center column in gray is um, what every engagement team is going to see. They're going to see whole ledger analytics. They're going to have access to automations, work paper automations for revenue, inventory, fixed assets, all the, the common work papers. So it's really a continuum. And depending on where you start and uh, how you move through your career, you can end up in any one of these three buckets for audit or tax or advisory. So that's it on, on my slides. I'll, I'll pause there for questions and, and kick it back to Vern. You know, uh, we have a stream of questions coming in, and I think I'll try and save most of those for the Q&A portion at the uh, end of this year. Um, so anybody listening, if you do have questions that are on your mind, by all means, type them, submit them. I've got a stack of five or six or seven already that are piling up. Vern, if you want to pivot into uh, your turn at the, in the cockpit, go right ahead. Great. So we've gotten a good example of, of the skills that are needed, the analytics that are performed at various levels. And I guess, Agadim, we kind of take a more basic view and just say, how did we get here? And uh, so just looking at the global uh, data sphere, uh, we see the data is increasing and we see the machines are becoming more powerful. So between data availability and uh, the changing machines, we're seeing a changed world. So we see the, the number of zettabytes increasing and continue to increase at a very quick level. And the statement that accounting uh, could be argued is no longer the de facto provider of information regarding the firm or firm performance. We're not the only providers anymore. There's a lot of information out there that's outside of just the accounting or the financial statements. Then on the right really talks about computers. And this is now a pretty old site, but uh, two authors, Frey and Osborne, uh, essentially said, hey, we know uh, computerization or machines are coming. Uh, what's the chance there will be job losses? And, and uh, you know, I'm one that doesn't believe accounting will go extinct, uh, but I do believe accounting will change. And so if you're an athletic trainer, machines aren't going to change your job. Uh, but if you're a telemarketer or accounting or an auditor, 94% chance of job losses within the next two decades. So that kind of sets us up. These two... Uh, changes are changing our jobs. And, and looking at, uh, this is, uh, look closely, this is, this is the AICPA's 2019 Accounting Graduate Supply and Demand Report. And this is trends in new um, bachelors and masters of accounting hired into the accounting and finance function. And so you can kind of see the purple line there on top uh, is uh, the bachelors. Uh, the blue line there is the ones, those with master's degrees in accounting. And then there's the total non-accounting. And, uh, and so we just see this, this surge and we would argue many of us that this is data science and, and on econ and, and other areas that are being brought in. And, and perhaps the accounting finance function is changing or perhaps there's an emphasis on machine learning or, or machines, computerization and data and, and uh, harnessing that data. And so as we look at those, we see the world is changing. So some of you have been in kind of educational psychology are familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, and this is critical thinking skills, starting at the bottom from remember. And if you remember kind of what we learned in high school, uh, a lot of it was memorizations, even undergrad is often memorization. And then it goes to understand and apply and analyze. But the first three levels of the remember, understand and apply are where machines excel. That's machines can remember, they can follow road instructions, we can program it. Hey, they're really, they're better remembering than I am. So we need to move up our game to the more critical thinking skills. So as academics, we think, hey, where do we need to play and where do we need to train our students or our graduates to analyze, okay? Analytics, right? Analyze, evaluate and create. That's where we need to play. It doesn't mean we don't have to take intro accounting and don't have to know the debits and credits, but it does mean we've got to move up the learning curve and, and, and get uh, quicker to those analysis skills. And so those are the skills we need to develop. So uh, we also know that the role of the accountant is changing. Uh, before we were the, the de facto information provider. If you needed information, you'd go to your accountant. And now frequently there, with so much data out there, our roles are changing uh, between us and, and the decision maker. You know, essentially we're gonna be the interpreter. We're gonna be the go between. We know what the management questions are. We know what data is available. We know what the data can provide. We can go and speak with the analysts 
for the data scientists and extract and get that data. But we've got to have all those skills. Now, are we going to be writing code every day? Probably not. But are we actually going to be, you know, uh, discussing and interpreting and trying to answer questions? Absolutely. So we see our role changing there. And so uh, with all these new skills needed, how are we changing accounting curricula? Okay, so I'm an accounting professor, been working at this for 23 years or so. And um, essentially, this is the first net new course in accounting in 30 years. So the classes I took in 1987 at BYU are, are pretty much the same courses I take now. And, uh, and so how are we teaching these new skills? Well, as of a year or so back, our textbooks hadn't changed for 30 years. Our courses hadn't changed in 30 years. The CPA exam hadn't changed much in 30 years. Professors don't use data in the course, even Excel. We don't use regression. We don't do classification. We don't do bankruptcy prediction. We don't do profiling. We don't do forecasting. We're really good at measuring the past, but not so good at predicting the future. So bad at forecasting. Uh, we may or may not cover Benford's law. We may talk about XBRL, go calc bench, you know, essentially talking about you know, the data that's available out there and it wasn't really covered or even the ETL, which stands for extract, transform and load is getting access to the data. Do we teach SQL? Do we know how to access big data? Do we use, you know, Power Query or Power Pivot? Do we know how to, to access big data sets? How do we deal with missing data? Can we even use VLOOKUPs? You know, those types of things, really not. But there's been an incredible movement in the last two years and, and essentially, um, we are moving that direction. I would say 75% of accounting programs now cover analytics at some level. And the AAS, AACSB, the, that's the association, the, the accreditation body for business schools and for accounting programs, essentially now requires uh, covering technology and analytics. The CPA exam is changing. You know, more details are coming out all the time covering analytics. So we're on our way uh, to getting there. And so uh, I'm the one that believes that every accounting course will be infiltrated with analytics, every single one, and um, that it's coming. Uh, and so we're, we're starting to get there. You know, when you come and try to uh, develop uh, a, a new course, first net new course in 30 years, you need to provide a foundation, a basis, a, a theoretic frame of some sort. And this is the easiest one I could come up with it's called the AMPS model. AMPS model is ask the question, master the data, perform the analysis, share the story that Brian referred to earlier. And essentially, this is a way of thinking. We have a question. Can we carefully specify that question? Can we go get the data? What data is appropriate? Will it be financial statements? Will it be cost accounting data? Will it be standards? You know, will it be um, you know, social media data? Will it be macroeconomic data, stock market data? What, is, what are we gonna use? And then we're gonna perform the analysis. So are we gonna do um, descriptive analytics, diagnostic analytics, predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics? some sort of machine learning. And then how are we gonna share the story? How are we gonna communicate the results, uh, perhaps in visualizations or otherwise? And so this is kind of the foundation that we've made uh, in, in our books uh, uh, that we were publishing and, and starting to get out there in the field in this area. I really wanted to highlight, maybe, maybe I'll stop there. I'm not as good at Brian as stopping, but any questions to this point, Matt or, or Brian that uh, would help? Let me take a breath, I guess. I, well, we do have a couple of people here asking about the implications for less need of human auditors. And I was going to save that up for the end, but I guess maybe I'll throw that out here right now. And I know you had touched on that before, that uh, analytics and automation are going to touch the accounting profession. But uh, I mean, clearly, when we've got multiple people asking about less need for human auditors, it's something high on the mind. I don't know if you've got other additional thoughts about. But uh, all I know is, is, is when I audited now some years back, you know, there was a whole, you know, 15 people in the room just inputting invoices mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, doing basic bookkeeping. Those are basically gone. Right. And but it's the higher level. I mean, my dad would always say there's always on, room on top for the best. I mean, yep. there's always room for those who have the appropriate skills, but we have to continue to skill up. If we don't have a net new course in the last 30 years, we're not really, you know, if this is the first one and there's going to be many more courses, you know, we've just got to skill up and, and be able to, you know, uh, to complement the computers and complement, you know, the data and use the data to make us better. 
And uh, I think there will be job changes, absolutely. I'm not sure about job losses, except to the extent that we don't keep up our skill set. So that that's probably what I would argue. I'll Brian. second that. That was that was well said. Uh, we haven't seen a, a diminution in the need for for auditors. We've just seen a, a shift in the skill sets, um, as Vern said. Uh, audits are looking differently now, and increasingly so in the coming years. And uh, we need a new a new generation of auditors that are comfortable in that environment and not just doing it the way that we did it 20 years ago. You know, I'd, I'm reminded of a story I once heard from a CFO in an investor conference talking about a new tech system he was implementing. And the vendor said, well, look, this is going to be a great system. You'll be able to do whatever you want to do with financial reporting. And the CFO told the audience, it's like, I realized, oh, crap, now I have to know what I want to do. <laughs> and people listening today, like there is a business to be able to help CFOs figure out what it is they want to do when they can do anything. So I, I'm still very bullish on there's going to be a lot of demand for these higher function skills that you both are talking about. And that's more interesting, Matt. That's a more satisfying, uh, I think, activity than, than you know, taking and tying, right? Thinking through the possibilities of an analytic engine and what that could mean for financial reporting risk and insights coming out of that. That's fun. Yeah. Very so uh, th there are a number of things we could cover uh, here. I, I just wanted to kind of point out what is in a data analytics class. What, what would be included? And so uh, Benford's law, which many are familiar with, the distribution of the first digit, you know, if you took the population of countries of the world, guess what? Conforms with Benford's law, as does, you know, many financial transactions. We actually use Dillard's department store data. We have access to that at the University of Arkansas. So we've got a ton of real world data that we use and you can apply Benford's law to that. Uh, I'm going to show an example here of Altman Z, but it gets students thinking about predicting bankruptcy. What has been done? What does the research show? And it's a great way to, to apply some skills. I'll show that momentarily. But typically in a cost accounting class, you say, here are the cost drivers that the company has determined. Hey, how about we actually run regression and we find and we discover those cost drivers. So that's what we do. Estimating cost behavior. You know, and, uh, those textbooks still uh, show the high-low method. Hey, how about we try regression? and uh, look at that and estimate cost behavior. Looking at outliers, kind of diagnostic analytics, variances, controls testing, even the use of conditional formatting, you know, doing gap detection. Uh, forecasting is another area that I don't think the traditional accounting program has done very well in. We do a really good job. We have three classes, four classes, five classes measuring in the past and zero classes forecasting the future. How about we do that? Uh, Excel has a forecast sheet, uh, really easy to use, talk about seasonality and, and rolling forward, look at the persistence of sales and the persistence of earnings and make that part of the common dialogue. You know, the goal seek function, you know, determining break even levels or even today with a student, they said, what grade do I need to get on the final because I bombed the midterm. <laughs> hey, let's look at the goal seek function and figure out what you need to get. Uh, scenario analysis, fuzzy matching, you know, an exercise, a good, good chance to talk about type one and type two errors, how many, you know, uh, uh, false positives, false neg negatives you want to look at, um, hypothesis testing, you know, just some basic statistics, some t-tests, you know, higher returns. We, we look at um, predicting sales returns and, and looking at uh, kind of with Dillard's data, essentially look at predicting uh, sales return on holidays or weekends or or so forth. And then some just some basic sensitivity analysis. You know, a lot of these topics are ones we've covered for a long time, but now it's with different framing. And so uh, it's it's uh, really a way to think about uh, analytics and, and how we might cover it in the classroom. I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to talk very quickly, but we use uh, Altman Z uh, bankruptcy prediction, now very old, but still very applicable. And Altman, uh, NYU there, uh, in 1969 said, hey, uh, we found five factors that predict bankruptcy. And so what would I do is I give the students, you know, a hundred line items out of CalcBench or something or, and, and essentially say, hey, let's compute fi the five factors. Let's apply weight uh, to those factors based on the regressions that Altman ran. Let's put them into buckets or histograms and then predict bankruptcy status. And then based on the score, we could put them in one of the zones, either distress zone, gray zone or safe zone. So that would be an example of a lab. And that lab, we do 50 or so of those each semester of those labs uh, predicting all sorts of things or, or uh, prescriptive analytics or so forth. So that's an example of what we might do and uh, example in, in, uh, in one of my textbooks. So uh, I think that uh, is where we're at. Uh, and so I'll open it up for questions. 
we, we have a bunch of questions here. Matt, if you want to go back two slides, I had a comment there I, I, I couldn't resist making here. Go back one more. So if you, if you look here at, uh, at Benford's Law, um, I wanted to highlight that Benford's Law applies really, really well for naturally occurring number sequences in, in nature, but mm -hmm. may not apply really well for a company. Uh, if a company sells everything for $9.99, for example, you're going to get a lot of nines. And that you won't see in a naturally occurring number sequence. So when I mentioned derivations of Benford's, what we're doing there is we're using com the company's own data from prior years to create a Benford's context yeah, to normalize the current year Benford's against the company's own data. That's cool. Which yeah, is very, and that's great expectation. That's diagnostic analytics, setting an expectation and then seeing departure. Yeah. So excellent. And the second point I'll make, Vern, is I, I told you just a few minutes ago that we were uh, looking at a regression this morning. Uh, you'll be pleased to hear that that was, we were uh, predicting operating costs. Uh, and instead of deciding in advance what we thought would drive that, we ran a random forest model awesome. that, that highlighted the top five drivers of OpEx. So a great a real life example for your story there. Yeah, excellent, thank you. So, so we had really quickly, very, just one second. Um, all of this, the, the great thing about all of these techniques is it requires the input of world-class you know, data to, to, do, to do these things. And with, uh, with the advent of XBRL and you know, tools like CalcBench, the input is just there. Now, all you need to do is to consider, you know, is the stuff coming in clean enough to run the analysis? And all, you know, years ago, it was always about, oh, do I have enough data to run it? It's not about that anymore. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, you're uh, just like we are. It's sort of like, uh, you know, being in a candy store as a kid, it's good stuff. Yeah. yeah, we call that the democratization of data. You get it clean and organized and give people tools they can explore. Yep. So here's the first question we have from a listener. Is the innovation we're talking about essentially a US story right now because XBRL and data tagging are only starting to be mandatory in the EU and other jurisdictions? And it has been here for the better part of a decade. Um, Brian, I'll let you feel that first. And Vern, if you have any thoughts, I'm eager to hear them. But Brian, what do you think to that? Sure. Um, when we talk about sort of the macro data and the risk profiling and things like that, we do certainly have uh, globally a leadership position in, in, uh, in well-organized homogenous data, um, which is a, a, a real privilege uh, in the U.S. I wouldn't say that the profiling opportunities are limited to the U.S., but it's certainly, uh, there's certainly more data here. Uh, that's accessible and clean. Um, then when you look at the micro data and, and, and you know, everybody's got a GL, so you can use some of our you know, whole ledger analytics and other uh, engagement level analytics anywhere in the world. Um, you do run into nuances with, with language if you're using text analytics, understanding characters versus letters and things like that. But, um, but yeah, it's a continuum, uh, certainly not limited to the US, but it's, this is definitely, uh, it's easier here with the, with, the, with the macro data at least. Uh, Vern, here's another question that I think might be more up your alley. Somebody is asking, do you see a difference in the skill sets needed for assurance and audit students versus valuation projects and uh, valuation track for students? We, we don't really differentiate it that way. Obviously, a different set. I mean, I would guess auditors would be more diagnostic analytics, and I would guess valuation would be more predictive and prescriptive analytics it would be their expectation. Uh, you know, I would guess more forecasting would be needed in valuation than, than in audit. Uh, we don't really treat them that way. We say we think you need to know it all, at least at this point. We know we're early on. I mean, we're writing first and second editions of textbooks that we know will change dramatically in the future. And I think we'll be able to specialize. But what's happening now in the textbook world is the analytics are starting to be spread to the, the individual topic areas, the, the cost accountings, the financial statement analysis, the audit class instead of just an overall course. You know, funny enough, we just have a comment from a listener here saying, I think the solution is including data analytics across the curriculum. So instead of creating new courses, change the way these courses are taught and presented, which seems like it's right up the alley. And, and I just have a very quick question. Uh, comment is the, the, the roadblock is professors. It's professors <laughs> that have taught the same course for 30 years, same using the same PowerPoint deck. Mm -hmm. uh, because you go teach analytics and you tell someone they're going to teach Tableau or Power BI and they're not familiar with that, 
is not going to happen. And so it, it, it's, it's just slowly getting there. Uh, and, and we have to have all the curriculum materials available and easy for professors to adopt. Yeah. Uh, Brian, here's another question that I think might be well suited for you. Uh, how do you see tax people using data analytics? Sure. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's, it's a similar blend, I think, of, of analytics and automation. Um, I would say automation is probably a little bit heavier than analytics relative to what we see in audit. Um, uh, tax is, is even more rules-based than, than audit. Uh, certainly judgment areas there that, that the tools can direct our, our professionals to to make judgments there. Uh, but I think it's a lot of automation. Okay. Uh, here's another question that uh, might be suitable for you both. Is the goal of data analytics data analytics eventually to replace traditional audit sampling techniques. How do you see traditional sampling and data analytics working together? Uh, I don't know who wants to take that first. Vern, maybe you, what do you think? Sure, you know, uh, obviously there's opportunity to sam uh, sample the full, not, I guess not even sample, but evaluate the full population, but you still wanna do it risk-based. You're not gonna be able to look in detail at every every observation and so, a lot of times you want to do some data reduction. You want to do kind of what Grant Thornton was just showing, you know, basically where you're highlighting the riskiest, largest material, you know, uh, transactions that have occurred and go back and audit those with a, a finer uh, brush. But certainly, you know, you're going to have your continuous monitoring, continuous auditing scenarios, which will kick out errors. And then you, you figure out, you know, which ones to evaluate further. So. Brian, yeah, this you... is a, a great a great question and certainly a, a topic that I think uh, uh, regulators across the world are, are thinking through um, when the, the question there is referred to testing 100% of populations. Um, in many cases, we're analyzing 100%. We may not be doing what would actually qualify as a test of details. Mm -hmm. um, so then uh, if it's not a test of details, where does it fit uh, in, in, in the audit framework? And it may be risk assessment, as Vern said. It may be a substantive analytic. Um, it may be that even after a really good SAP, we have to test a couple as a sample, yep. right? So it, right now, I think it's probably a blend, uh, but I could see a future state where the analytics receive a full evidentiary credit in, in the literature. Well, uh, along those lines, let me also ask, um, you had mentioned a solid grounding in uh, financial reporting standards and in audit standards to pursue this uh, career. I I'm just curious, where is the PCAOB in developing reliable standards for data analytics? Because this does seem like a point where the technology is ahead of the regulatory framework to get auditing done. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, uh, Brian or Vern, if you do, but like how mature are the standards right now to, to accommodate all of this? Sure, um, I'll, I'll speak to that because the, the PCAOB's Data and Technology Task Force uh, was convened by the PCAOB to help think through these issues. Uh, so they've been really good about, about uh, uh, asking questions here and, and seeing what the state of play is and where we could be headed. Um, as I alluded to a minute ago, everything we're doing today can fit within the standards. Mm -hmm. I just think that the standards could evolve so that the, some of these advanced techniques would receive more credit than they currently do. Yeah. So, and the PCAOB is really clear and they're correct that they're not uh, you know, prohibiting any of this new tech. Uh, it's just a, just a question of where does it fit and how much credit do you get? Yeah. Vern, do you have any thoughts? No, I, I, uh, it's, it's just interesting to, to figure out how they're going to stand. And, and, you know, it, it, it doesn't appear to be ignorance. It, it appears to be, you know, trying to figure out exactly what it can do and how to set a standard on analytics uh, is, is an open question. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody else asking, how far away are we from a future that has live audits? since we're moving rapidly into live data streaming and analytics, like why couldn't we just do continuous auditing like that or live auditing? Um, I, I don't know which one of you wants to take a stab at that first. I'll, I'll take a crack at it and then turn it over to Vern. Um, I would say we aren't far away from that capability. Mm -hmm. um, I, I often say that we can run the analytics that I talked about, the automations, as often as we can get access to the data. If we wanted to do that quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily, hourly, uh, real time, uh, that can be done. Uh, it becomes a question in my mind of what do investors really want? What would be the value um, in, in having access to um, audited data at that level 
at that time interval, right? Uh, so I think that's really more of a uh, investor demand question than it is a technological question. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it seems like the technology there is there. It's, it, you know, for me, it's the, the possibility of litigation, you know, an error is made and, and it goes out and, uh, you know, is there going to be a safe harbor or, or you know, so is the demand, demand heavier than, than the possible error in the litigation that might follow? All right. Um, I think then in the interest of time, we are probably up against it here. I don't know if maybe I'll give each of you uh, like one more minute or so just in closing thoughts about what you would recommend to either students about what they should be trying to do for a career in analytics or Brian, if you want to talk about uh, the, the potential here and how, how much more there is that we could mine. But uh, Vern, if you want to have a, a minute for closing thoughts, and then I'll give it to Brian too, and then I think we'll wrap up. Sure. Data and machines are changing accounting. And uh, I, I think we're up for a change we haven't had even bigger than Sarbanes-Oxley and bigger than Enron and WorldCom. You know, I think it's just a, a dramatic change for us all. And I think we're going to get there. I think universities are, are up for the challenge. We're just typically slow. And I'm not sure if COVID has sped us up or slowed us down, but uh, the curricular materials are going to be there. And some of it is just the, the ability of professors to deliver, because I can tell you the students want it and uh, it will continue to go forward. And if we don't figure it out in accounting, the best students will go to another field. So let's figure it out. All right, Brian, what's uh, the last word there? Yeah, I'll echo that. Uh, things are changing and, and, and I would encourage folks to be a part of the change, help to, to shape that change rather than let the change shape you. Uh, get involved and be a part of that evolution. It's a really, I think, making auditing more exciting than it's ever been. Uh, so it's a really neat time to, to get into the profession and you can peel off out of or back into audit in so many different ways. Now you mentioned valuation, uh, forensic work, uh, different kinds of advisory applications of the same analytics. Um, I, I see a world of possibilities for new professionals to do a lot of different things, um, starting with you know, a, a career in audit or coming into a career in audit. Um, I think it's easier now than ever to, uh, to really to, to have a, a tapestry of skills in your toolbox uh, than it was 20 years ago where maybe you learned how to audit and that's all you ever did. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, in that case, um, thank you everybody who has been listening. We do still have a bunch of questions we didn't get to. We'll try and ship those off to Vern and Brian after the fact and maybe they can follow up. But Vern Richardson of the University of Arkansas, Brian Wallahan of Grant Thornton and Pranav Guy of Calpench, thank you all for helping us out. This has been a great hour. I really appreciated everybody's time. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you, we appreciate it. Bye everybody, thank you. Thank you.